Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar, Fluorescence Guided Surgery of Head and Neck Cancer. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You may have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed for you. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of your attendee control panel. You can send your questions in at any time during the presentation and we'll collect them and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce your speaker, Dr. Jason Warham. Dr. Warham graduated from the Molecular and Cellular Pathology Graduate Program at the University of Alabama at Birmingham in 2011 with a PhD in Cancer Biology and Gene Therapy. His postdoctoral fellowship was conducted under the mentorship of Dr. Kurt Zinn in the Division of Advanced Medical Imaging Research at the University of Alabama at Birmingham Department of Radiology. In 2014, Dr. Warham joined the Department of Oncology as an assistant professor under the mentorship of Dr. Eben Rosenthal. His research interests include the development and clinical translation of novel imaging agents, image guided pathology, gene therapy, multimodal techniques in surgical oncology imaging, nuclear imaging, ultrasound contrast agents, combination therapeutic strategies and antibody-based molecular imaging and therapy. He has published over 70 peer-reviewed journal articles, holds grants from NIH and DOD, and has over five years experience overseeing clinical trials using fluorescence guided surgery in head and neck cancer. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over to Dr. Warham. Dr. Warham, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gil. Um, good morning to everyone, or good, e good evening, wherever you may be. Um, thank you to the organizers for the invitation to be a part of this. It's very exciting. Um, I'd like to open with my disclosures, and um, I'll let you know that a lot of the data that you'll see is, is in part uh, the brainchild of my clinical collaborator, Dr. Rosenthal. Um, and uh, what you'll see is the use of, of antibody-based strategies for for uh, head and neck cancer and surgery. Um, originally, uh, I think in 2005, uh, we, we first sat down, uh, Dr. Zinn, Dr. Rosenthal, and myself to discuss uh, how we could translate uh, imaging agents to guide, to guide surgery. Um, the strategy that we wanted to use was, uh, was to repurpose uh, the individual elements, the three elements, the vehicle, the the molecule, the dye molecule, and, uh, and the, the camera uh, repurposed uh, these elements that are already being used in the clinic to streamline um, the, the IND and, and, and hopefully the FDA approval. So after several years of, of doing preclinical research and, and uh, testing different, the d different elements that we could use, we, we settled on uh, Cetuximab, which uh, was, was uh, GMP produced uh, here at UAB, the vector production facility, um, and we partnered with with Lycor using the IR dye hunter molecule um, because it was it was uh, a, a very efficient molecule and it was closest to, to clinical use at that time with a drug master file available. Uh, and then uh, after our pre ID meeting, we set out to uh, to show that there was no difference between. Uh, the use of uh, a fluorescent labeled cetuximab versus unlabeled cetuximab in, in uh, non-human primate studies, uh, which which pacified the uh, the FDA. And so we move forward in a dose escalation trial. Uh, the the unique aspect of our diet hunter to survive the patholo pathological processing allowed us to follow the the, the dye molecule and targeted tissues throughout. The processing or throughout surgical care, and so as we began to talk early, early in 2013, when we enrolled our first patient, uh, we we wanted to be able to capture every uh, every available amount of data that we could throughout the whole process, 
um, because ultimately we weren't sure where where the the patient benefit would lie, where the where the, the pathway to FDA approval would lie, and and routine use. And so, in addition to to doing the intraoperative imaging, which was the which was kind of the target, uh, our dimolic our our antibody conjugate um, uh, had a uh, uh, 24 to 48 hour half-life so we were able to image um, two to three days prior to surgery after the infusion in the operating room uh, in a back table setting or, or in uh, Frozen's lab during intraoperative assessment and also uh, finally at the at the, the histological level uh, where we could sit with the pathologist as they were uh, grading the slides of the tissues that were obtained and, and then juxtapose that with the fluorescence images of those slides to help localize this, the surgeon, or, the, or excuse me, the pathologist to where the, the disease was. And in order to do that, we used three different imaging systems that um, uh, we used throughout the day during the case. Um, a lot of these, in most of these cases, the, the tissues were not formed and fixed before they were dissected. So we were, apps, we were able to, to complete all this data collection at least from one to three in the same day. And then we came back a couple of days later with the pathologist for, for, uh, for the histological analysis. Um, as I mentioned, the the, the dose was given um, uh, 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 two two to five days prior to surgery, um, and it was given with a with a with what we called a loading dose, which was uh, an unlabeled dose of uh, cetuximab. Uh, and then we did uh, daily imaging in the clinic, as you can see in panel A, and then obviously uh, uh, the intraoperative imaging in panel B, and then back table imaging. Uh, in panel C uh, in order to collect the, the different amounts of data. Uh, in one case, and I, I put this cue up here, the, the linking patient benefit um, to kind of, what I want to do as I go through today is, is to, to highlight areas that we discovered individual cases, uh, while they be anecdotal, uh, showed that there was, there, was, there was benefit, patient benefit to be had uh, when using the technology. And in this case, uh, we, uh, a couple of days prior to surgery, when we were doing the the uh, daily imaging, um, we we would image the primary, uh, and then when we would we would image background tissues like the forearm, oral mucosa. We would also image the neck, and in this case, we uh, we discovered this hot area um, of of high fluorescence intensity in uh, in this gentleman and uh, neck area, and we brought it to the attention of the surgeon. Uh, and the surgeon then used his expertise and training to, uh, to, de to decide to, to harvest that area of, of high fluorescence, and it turned out to be um, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, uh, which, which I know a lot of, a lot of groups are, are looking at um, same-day in injections, and, and in those cases, this might not be beneficial, but uh, for, those, for those agents that are given days prior to surgery, this is, this is an available area that can be tapped um, for to, to, to guide surgeons to occult lesions. Um, so since 2013, um, uh, at Stanford and at UAB, we I think we've done over 50 cases of head and neck cancer using uh, either cetuximab, iodine 100, or penetumumab, iodine 100, uh, and we we published extensively on on uh, on the use of that and in, in identifying the primary, but also the lymph nodes. Um, as you can see in the right panel, and uh, Dr. William Carroll is is, uh, is the chair of otolaryngology here at UAB, and he's my my primary clinical collaborator here. And then then uh, Dr. Rosenthal, obviously at Stanford, is uh, we still we work at UAB under under the uh, under that IND as a subsite uh, for the clinical trial. Uh, so in our our, uh, our our initial cetuximab trial, we had uh, dose escalation, as I mentioned. Uh, starting at the 2.5 mix per a meter squared uh, microdose, and as you can see, um, through three patients, we we didn't get a lot of positive contrast uh, at the at the the open open field level. Um, at the pathological level, we could see some some targeting of cancer, although the contrast was again very weak. It wasn't until we moved to the second dose, which was one tenth of the therapeutic dose of tetuximab, that we began to see positive contrast. And then at the highest dose, which was a one-quarter dose of, of uh, therapeutic cetuximab, uh, we didn't gain a lot of uh, contrast as we moved from the from the one-tenth dose to the quarter dose. 
uh, primarily because of the background tissues. Tuxmab uh, binds EGFR, which is um, uh, EGFR is, is robustly expressed in the skin and the oral mucosa, and oftentimes these were the areas of our tumors. Uh, here's an example of uh, one of the cases that we did using Stuxmab uh, Iron Giant 100. As you can see, the clear uh, clear area contrast here uh, on this patient that uh, was getting glossectomy, and this is after the uh, mandibulotomy. There, you can see in the in the picture in the in the left corner. Uh, example, another example of patient benefit is is when we were doing this case, the oromaxillofacial surgeon uh, was unsure of the sort of advanced edge of the cancer. And the, the standard of care is, is to do a, uh, a partial glossectomy if the cancer is not spread over the midline, uh, which was originally his surgical plan. But as you can see here, once he started to, uh, to do the uh, fluorescence imaging, and it, the, the, the feedback from the camera allowed him to use his training and expertise to, to reassess the leading edge. And uh, he ended up taking the whole tongue because it was clear that the cancer had spread over the midline. Uh, so this is an example where this, it, it, it changed the, uh, the surgical plan uh, after the surgery had begun, but before the, the primary was resected. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do early on was um, we would always get the question of does, does the areas of, of, of uh, intense fluorescence, does that correlate with disease? And so we set out early to, to define that, to define specificity and to understand exactly what we were looking at intraoperatively when the tissue was in situ and, and then compare that to pathology. And so we ended up uh, grossing these specimens very closely with the processor uh, to, to mark where these margins were, were taken from, register them back to the primary. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the pictures, I don't know if you can see my mouse here. The, Pictures uh, uh, with the Roman numerals, those were the uh, five millimeter bread loaf sections of that primary and then with the adjacent five micron uh, H&E stains of those tissues um, in order to show where the, the disease and the fluorescence were overlapping. Uh, but this was very helpful. It allowed us to say that, um, to, to demonstrate that the areas of fluorescence correlated with disease is that is the antibody was, was binding in those areas. One of the, one of the things, let's see, I don't know why that's not showing up there. Um, one, of, one of the things that we wanted to do early on was also test some quantification techniques. Uh, the graph there on the far left, I, the, the data points aren't there. I'm not sure what's going on. But um, the idea was uh, to, to, to use a standardized background tissue in order to uh, develop a threshold, a threshold much like the standard uptake standardized uptake value that's used in PET. Uh, and we wanted to dis establish a value that would allow us to say, um, predict whether or not the, the tissue that we were sampling was was uh, was positive for cancer or not. And and uh, when we used muscle normalization for tissue, we discovered a threshold of 2.7 gave us a sensitivity of 90%. Uh, when we used skin to normalize the threshold, uh, the sensitivity was 92%. Um, a lot of we subsequently published this in, in Journal of Surgical Oncology, but um, it's I, I, after meeting and with the FDA and having multiple discussions um, with the various parties and people in this field, uh, true quantification isn't possible, but uh, semi-quantification um, might be possible, but the, the decision-making still needs to lie in the surgeon's training and ex expertise. Uh, and also, the, the normalized tissue that you're going to use for background to establish your threshold value, it's, it needs to be target dependent. For example, EGFR is expressed in the skin, but not in the muscles. So as we ramped up the dose, it changed the threshold for the skin normalized values. And, and I know that's complicated. It's actually not very complicated. It's actually very simple because I, that's how I like things. But, but, uh, but I, I would be happy to discuss this with anybody at any time. I wanted to talk about the the benefits or the possibilities of using uh, semi-quantification values for thresholding disease. Uh, moving moving towards uh, pathology, uh, we were able to show that um, the uh, the disease in the fluorescence, as well as the EGFR uh, staining, um, demonstrated where the where the uh, the conjugate was was targeting, and um, you can see in the graph 
uh, the relative the, the mean fluorescence intensities that we saw in the, between the tumor normal and muscle um, uh, throughout the trial and the dose escalation. Uh, uh, Esther Devore was a was an amazing um, a PhD student that that uh, we we borrowed from Go Van Dam's lab um, when we were doing the trial and 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 her arrival and the beginning of the trial really really sparked a lot of uh, a lot of innovation and and discovery and analysis here that we were really excited about and Esther piloted a lot of that. Uh, one of the things that she she painstakingly did was to correlate the mean fluorescence intensity and EGFR density. And as you show, uh, with the dose escalations, we got a linear response or linear correlation between EGFR and MFI, um, which allowed us to say that the that the the targeting was was EGFR dependent. Um, and and then she we did a lot of additional stating using cytokeratin as our uh, our our gold standard for identifying squam squam cell carcinoma uh, in our tissues and then correlating that back with H and E and then the fluorescence that we were seeing in these these are five micron uh, deparaffinized tissue sections uh, on on glass that we used uh, we used the the, the LIPO or Odyssey to to fluorescently scan those. Uh, another thing that Esther did that was very, very clever was to um, to measure in these five micron samples um, using the the resolution of the LIPO Odyssey, which is 20 micron, uh, allowed us to to see how the how the the border of the tumor and normal interface, uh, how much uh, diffusion there was of the fluorescence intensity into those normal areas, and we showed a very sharp sharp drop off. Even when you moved out five millimeters from the from the uh, the areas of disease, and then um, Esther also worked very hard to correlate the um, the different characteristics of the tumor uh, using the cytokeratin staining as the gold standard, H and E, and then EGFR expression along with factor factor eight and uh, KS67 pr uh, proliferation and um, uh, vessel density uh, respectively, uh, and during the multivariate analysis, there was a strong correlation between EGFR density and um, and the uh, fluorescence intensity uh, for the microdose and the one tenth dose. Uh, it wasn't present in the in the highest dose, and we again feel like uh, that dose was was uh, was too high, uh, which was why we subsequently settled on the 25 mg per meter squared dose. And then another look at, um, at how the specificity of the disease overlaps with the with the H&E, uh, as we had the pathologist kind of draw in these areas where he saw the cancer. Uh, and then microscopically, um, I think uh, these images were, were obtained uh, uh, by Esther through Go Van Dam, uh, who helped us out a lot uh, during the trial to identify uh, microscopically where the iodide hunter fluorescence overlapped with with the H&E uh, for the disease of that line. And then we additionally showed this uh, using uh, using the uh, lymph nodes. Uh, so in cancer, the metastasized lymph nodes in the surf areas, uh, we showed that the fluorescence in the H&E, uh, as well as the EGFR stain and the cytokeratin stain for for the uh, for the uh, cold stain or for squam. Another thing that we wanted to do um, uh, our endeavor again. This is a this is a very exciting time when we began to pull these tissues out, and one of the areas that we really wanted to tap into was the use of intraoperative assessment um, to to, uh, to test uh, to test these margins, whether they were uh, resected from the primary or the margins were resected from the wound bed uh, prior to resection or or post resection wound bed. And uh, so we wanted to test the strength of the fluorescence. Uh, to identify small areas of, of cancer that could could rest or see, be seeded in these uh, in these margins, and so we simulated these margins by by taking a little bit of the primary tumor from and then and then placing it on patient match muscle skin and uh, adipose tissue uh, to kind of demonstrate the feasibility of using this uh, to to identify positive areas for the pathologist to harvest uh, during the intraoperative assessment in the Prozens lab. And because uh, a lot of times, as, as many of you probably know, uh, these margins um, they're they're just sampled. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of information that's lost um, just from sample error. 
and discordance. Um, but um, but breaking into the field of pathology um, is 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 challenging. And I think um, um, I think in, in the coming future it'll it'll be something that'll be used routinely. So um, one of the things that we're doing now at UAB um, uniquely is. Uh, we're able to use um, the the uh, intuitive robot systems uh, during transoral robotic surgery uh, to identify uh, cancer during during uh, the r robotic surgery. One of the one of the things that um, is 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 kind of intuitive. Pardon the pun, but uh, during surgery, the surgeon lo loses his ability for tactile feedback um, when when working in the robotic uh, area, and so. Uh, because they're losing one of the one of the key tools that they use to identify cancer, this is this is a this is a very ripe area to to tap in order to use the fluorescence or some targeted some targeted optical aid to to guide the surgeon during surgery um, to to make up for or account for that loss of tactile feedback. Um, and so what we what we've been doing over the last couple of years is is um, um, administering the the agent in patients that are having the tours. Uh, procedures uh, and then uh, originally we were using the SI system uh, and the SI system has a has a imaging uh, LED powered imaging uh, camera on it fluorescence camera on it um, that I call the standard firefly and then with the recent introduction of the XI system there is uh, there's been some upgrades and advancements that's been done to the firefly um, to make it quote advanced uh, and so we've been taking taking a uh, a look at the comparison of these two, and again, uh, Dr. Carroll has uh, has been the surgeon who who runs the robot during surgery and allows us to take take pictures and have a look. Uh, so the first case I wanted to I wanted to introduce you to is the use of the SI system in a in a, uh, a patient that had a, a cancer in their piriform sinus. This isn't a traditionally a tours surgery, um, however, um, this this patient had TORS uh, procedure done with the piriform sinus tumor. Uh, and this patient received the penetumumab iodine 100 um, in a 50 milligram fixed dose. Um, moving forward, since 2017, we have um, completely switched over to penetumumab iodine 100 for, for the uh, EGFR targeted vehicle that we use. And um, in this, Uh, in this case, um, using the SI system uh, and the standard Firefly, you can see the tumor in the piriform sinus. It's, it's highlighted in yellow there on the left panel, uh, and you can see that this is the this is the fluorescence imaging uh, occurring right now. And there's very little very little signal at all uh, when the when this uh, primary was resected. As you can see in the lower right hand picture, um, this is an image that was acquired using our back table camera, the, the Luna. And so it was very clear that there was signal. There was a robust signal there. In fact, this patient had one of the highest tumor to vacuum ratios that we'd seen in the cetuximab trial. Uh, however, with the camera, the SI camera and the standard Firefly, uh, we weren't able to discern the primary upon approach. Uh, however, um, when uh, when the primary was was recepted from the patient, uh, and it went to the back table, and we we're performing that back table imaging. Um, the surgeon who did the case uh, was a was a resident here, and he actually came through the lab when we were doing a lot of our preclinical work. And he he saw the image that we that that was produced by the Luna of this primary specimen on the back table, and he thought that that area looked more suspicious than he was comfortable with. So, using his training and expertise, he decided to to return, and um, he went back in and was trying to lo localize the area that was deep to that. Uh, area of high intensity on the primary specimen. And as he zooms in here and turns on the fluorescence uh, camera, you can see that there's an area that is uh, brighter than the surrounding areas. And that area turned out to be um, cancer that was uh, that was a deep margin to that primary specimen. And so as we as we move from the SI system and the XI system, um, the advanced Firefly, the differences in the, in the upgrades in the advanced Firefly quickly became evident. Um, there was uh, there was removal of the background uh, blue LED that was uh, originally allowed to, um, to to localize uh, and visualize areas in the in the in the field. Uh, there was a movement of the optical chip 
uh, as well as an upgraded optical chip. The presets were, were added, uh, gain presets that were allow low, medium, and high in real time. And then uh, black point imaging uh, allows you to adjust the window levels um, as, as you can you can do that on the fly in real time as well. And you can see the relative uh, pictures, the, the comparison between the standard Firefly and the advanced Firefly um, on the center and right. Um, and if this is a patient that had a lateral pharyngeal wall invasive tongue cancer. Uh, and during this case, the surgeon, uh, that cursor that you see moving in the video, that's, that's the surgeon actually uh, kind of highlighting an area, uh, a border between uh, high and low intensity of fluorescence. And he's kind of zooming in on it now. And uh, we have those areas uh, highlighted on the top right with the red arrows. And um, as, as the surgeon kind of explores the, the surgical field, uh, trying to determine uh, where those those borders of fluorescence occur, there's um, there's there's a lot of it, there's a lot of improvements still remain to be done. As you can see, see there's there's um, the field uniformity is is highly irregular with this halo that that's in the screen. Um, and he's going to back up here in just a second and, and look at an area just to the left there. You can see, um, again, you can, you can make out that, that halo that occurs, but there's promise here. And there's, there's, there's certainly improvement from the standard Firefly. Uh, here's another example uh, of a lateral pharyngeal cancer. Um, and you can see the differences between the low and the high gain in those panels. And uh, the 16 color uh, lookup table is something that I added um, using ImageJ software uh, after the case to kind of get an idea of, of uh, if, you, if you change the color lookup table to something that uh, would allow uh, higher differentiation and contrast between different areas of tissue and what kind of gain it would, that would have for the surgeon. Um, and then uh, there's another case that I wanted to bring or end with. Actually, um, this was um, this was a uh, a case where there was a a lymph node that was identifiable by fluorescence imaging, but it was negative on FTG PET, and surgically it was not suspicious as it it, it, it lied just deep to the primary tumor. So after resection, um, we we traditionally do a post resection wound bed scan. And so as the surgeon was doing that, he noticed this area of, of high fluorescence there, right in the center, you can make it out. Uh, and he remembered that the, uh, the, that lymph node was identifiable on CT, but it was, it was not hot on, on FDG. So uh, he decided to resect it and harvest that lymph node, and it turned out to be positive for cancer. Uh, and as you can see, the back table imaging with the, with the, um, the open field Luna device, uh, the, the comparison of the fluorescence there. And then, let's see, hang on this. So here's the, uh, here's the post, post harvesting of that lymph node and you can see that the wound bed is nice and dark now. Um, and so he felt comfortable that he had, uh, he had harvested all of the lymph node. Uh, and the, the delta between the fluorescence uh, intensity and the pre and post resection uh, is another area metric that we can easily tap to, to discern uh, patient benefit. So yeah, so there's uh, there's a lot of people to thank. Um, I think uh, the secret to I, I think all of the scientists would agree the secret to our success is by surrounding our people with surrounding ourselves with people that are smarter than us. And I I've truly been blessed to have that. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to thank all my collaborators and uh, Dr. Rosenthal, Dr. Zinn, of course, and the wonderful people that I get to work with every day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Warham. And we are now going to begin answering the questions that have been submitted so far during the presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the questions box in your attendee control panel. So our first question here today is, what was the purpose of the unlabeled loading dose? Uh, right, so uh, with, the, with the standard therapy using cetuximab, um, every patient is given a 10 milligram uh, a test dose prior to receiving their infusion of, uh, you know, usually several hundred milligrams of cetuximab um, based on body surface area. 
Uh, and the reason for that is there's a high incidence of infusion reactions with, with cetuximab. Uh, I think it's 16% here in the southeast of the states. And, and so one of the things that we, we wanted to convince the FDA that we needed to, to use that test dose but increase it to 100 milligrams. And what this would allow to do is to, is to kind of cover that sink of, of EGFR receptors. Um, and so we called it a loading dose because uh, we were actually front loading um, EGFR receptors that we did not want to bind with our conjugate. And subsequently, uh, we published a paper in molecular imaging biology showing the difference uh, because there was a cohort of patients where we did not give the loading dose and they had uh, much lower uh, tumor to background ratios than those who did receive the loading dose. However, now we've switched over to pentatumumab and in pentatumumab standard care is no loading dose because there's less than 1% uh, infusion reactions with pentatumumab. So uh, we kind of lost that feature, but uh, we, we, we feel like it's much safer for the patient overall uh, using the pentatumumab. Thank you very much. And a question here from the audience. What is the smallest size a tumor can be detected with fluorescence? So uh, that's, that's a complex question. Um, uh, I think um, fluorescence obviously has, has extremely high resolution and um, uh, theoretically under optimal conditions, you could identify single cells using fluorescence. Um, however, um, when, when, you, when you juxtapose that to the conditions of, of uh, surgical oncology where um, if, if there is a small island of tumors or, or cancer cells that are away from the primary, uh, whether or not you can identify it has, has so many different factors uh, from, uh, from overlying tissue to um, the amount of expression your target is uh, on those cancer cells. So the, sh the short of it, it's really difficult to say, and um, and we've we've tried to we've tried to characterize that, and we we've, we've published papers trying to develop models to to test to see what the smallest amount you can you can identify, uh, and certainly if and I can refer you to those papers, um, you know we were able to to see down to you know just one one to ten to the fifth cells uh, in small small tumors um, in in mouse models, but um, because it's such a complicated question, because the the, the electromagnetic uh, electromagnetic radiation in using optical, uh, particularly fluorescence, is is a, is a weak energy uh, radiation. Uh, there's there's too many factors um, to to kind of give you a flat out answer, and, and so um, so sorry if, sorry that I didn't answer your question, but just kind of talked around it. But uh, it's a complex complex question. Yeah. Thank you very much. And our next question here, could we use fluorescent probes that have the affinity for lymphatic WASP carriers for chemotherapy? Uh, I don't know, that is a good question. Um, certainly um, uh, antibody drug conjugates are, are, uh, are, are the, the next big thing and um, are, are, are being tested now. And um, so uh, I think the short answer is yes. I, I, I think anything's possible, uh, particularly in the, in the lymphatic realm. Uh, so yeah. Thank you very much. And our next question, they're coming in thick and fast here. Um, can you detect positive metastases before the dissection with fluorescence? Uh, so, so that is another uh, good question. The, uh, in our our, uh, uh, our our paper that we produced um, with the cervical lymph node imaging, uh, there were there were cases, uh, and certainly there are images in those cases where you can see prior to dissection, um, when we did the fluorescence imaging, you could make out positive lymph nodes, um, and and I, I guess I would say, uh, in the majority of cases where where lymphatic involvement was was evident, disease was was there, whether we could palpate it, see it, or it was showed up on 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 FDG. Um, in those cases, um, we could see prior to prior to uh, resection, we could see uh, large lymph nodes that were in fact positive for disease. Uh, the, the use of the technology uh, is, is is much more sensitive when you're uh, you're looking at dissected lymph nodes. 
uh, after the the levels have been removed, uh, the 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 pathological processors dissected them out, and those individual lymph nodes are, are can be imaged uh, either on the back table or in search path. Uh, and in those cases, we we could definitely identify um, uh, positive lymph nodes uh, after dissection using the fluorescence imaging with very high sensitivity. Um, and it, gained, it got to the point, and I, I detail this in, in that paper, that I began to trust the, the fluorescence imaging more than I trusted the pathologist. Because if a, if a, you know, a five by five millimeter lymph node came out and I could see that there was an area of fluorescence there that was very suspicious, uh, the pattern was very recognizable, but then uh, one, after it made it into the cassette and it was mounted on the slide, it was only a small percentage of that tissue that was actually sectioned and it came back negative. And so we would have them recut samples um, because I believe that there was, there was in fact disease there and in some cases there were. So yeah. Thank you very much, Jason. And um, more questions. What is the penetration of light that you are using? Well, the, so iodine 100 is the near infrared range and so um, in the infrared range, um, theoretically, you could have up to one centimeter of of, uh, of of penetration. Because we're dealing with fluorescence, it's it's uh, it's a two-way transfer of energy. So we not only need to get the excitation light uh, to the molecule within the tissue, but we also need to capture the emission light that's that's then coming. And so attenuation occurs in, in both pathways. Um, so realistically, um, and again. This, this, this is my my previous answer. Uh, a lot of this is dependent upon many, many factors, but in general, the one centimeter is under opt optimal conditions. I think, and realistically, it's it's more like half a centimeter, um, depending on the the source. If you have a, a big a, a big tumor that's sitting under a centimeter of tissue, for example, in the in the lymph nodes case, uh, then we were able to detect it, but it was only because there was a strong amount of source material there. Thank you very much. And that leads us on to our next question. How accurate is the use of image J to detect light intensity? Do you consider the distance of the light source? So uh, I, I use image J very, very little. Um, the 99% of, uh, of the post-processing analysis we do, we use uh, the, uh, all the system software that's on board the individual instruments. Um, and and the, the image J I only use to, to apply uh, false coloring for, for different color lookup tables and different spectrums. Um, and the, you're, when, you, when you're using the onboard system software, you have to take into account the differences between the devices you're using, uh, which which I could probably give a whole other talk on, uh, because as as we begin to 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 sort of modify a lot of these back table devices uh, to improve the sensitivity, uh, we we were able to 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 really increase uh, the amount of fluorescence that we could see by changing, um, in some cases, just software modifications. Uh, so yeah, so. Uh, I hope that answers your question. I only use MSJ uh, to color the. I don't actually use it for the for the analysis, particularly because uh, depending on the 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 size of the of the chip, you could uh, your scaled images that you would export to use an image J uh, would would not give you accurate values. Thank you very much, Jason. And that brings us to our final question that we have time for today. And the question is, when do you believe this technology will become a standard of care? Uh, so the biggest, so the biggest barrier, I think, uh, to making this this technology standard of care is adoption, and adoption um, adoption by the by the administration, by the hospital, by the by the surgeons. Um, I think those those three things are are, are the biggest barrier. Um, the uh, personally, I think that the audience that, that we need to target is the patient, um, just as Intuitive did um, the, by by marketing their robots to the patient population, and that drove uh, uh, production and sales and uh, use in, uh, in the institutions. Um, 
for this technology, this technology is it's very understandable um, and it's very intuitive. And, and a patient understands that, that uh, this technology will make their cancer light up so the surgeon can see more. And when the surgeon comes out and they say, did you get all the cancer? The surgeon always says the same thing. We got everything we could see. Well, this technology allows them to see more. So, so the question of when it's it's when adoption becomes widespread and adoption needs to be widespread when when the patients drive the adoption when the patients drive the use of technology as hospitals compete for patients thank you very much dr warham for that wonderful presentation and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar once you leave the webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation. So we'd be really grateful if you could keep your browser window open and complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours, which will include a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of the International Society of Fluorescence Guided Surgery with grant funding from Diagnostic Green and our presenter, thank you so much for joining us and please do enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.